Okay, so in this video we're going to be looking at changing the input gear on the LT230. This will be the LT230T. There are different variants of this transfer box and I've got to make you aware of them. Right, so first of all the LT230T has a collapsible spacer between the bearings that support the intermediate gear. Alright, now this is an important point because if you look down here, this also on the peg, it has a certain locking device. Right, you'll see it a bit clearer here. Now this is how you would recognise it initially. LT230Q also has this fitted. Right, well there also not only is a collapsible spacer, number 20, there's also a, a solid spacer and this is a little bit of a nightmare to uh, set up. However, we've got the collapsible spacer type here. You can see it on fitting it between the bearings. Alright, so this is the one we're going to work on. If, for instance, you're just going to do the input gear, don't bother taking the intermediate gear out. So the older type of LT230R has a um, plate here which you can see in the diagram. We don't actually have a gearbox to show you. This is not a ring peg. Basically the bearings are different and there is a thrust plate which you would set up by using feeler gauges and using a screwdriver to lift the gear up. Uh, this is completely different to the gearbox we're going to be working on now. You will be relieved to know that the input gear is fairly consistent through the uh, transfer box ranges as far as we know. However, the ratios of the actual gearing itself depends on the ratio of the gearbox, whether it's Defender, Discovery or Range Rover Classic, so we're not going to be giving out any part numbers. However, this is a modified version of the input gear. It has a drilling, so the splines will not wear as quickly as what they did in the gearbox we showed you earlier. Okay, so gasket set, if it needs one, will be BR3293. This is a bear mark number. If it hasn't got gaskets, it doesn't need gaskets, you use RTV silicon instead. But you will need the seals that fit in the transfer box. Right, identifying the transfer box, you will need to find the serial code on here, and this will tell you also what the ratio will be of your transfer box. Now this determines what gearing is inside it. Hopefully the transfer box has not had any type of modification to the gearing. Have a word with your Bearmark distributors using the terminology that we're going to give you and they'll be able to supply the parts. <laughs> Okay, so this is the transfer box looking at the back with a handbrake uh, mechanism removed and this is the housing which in the video you will see it's not actually there. Uh, this doesn't matter, you do not have to remove this, however we've done this so you can see what we're doing clearer. Right, basically the PTO cover, set of bolts, you remove those and you have yourself a bearing support plate underneath it, okay, and this has gaskets, so we will be using gaskets for this transfer box. This is the gear that we'll be removing, it's already worn, the splines are knackered so we need to change it. The sump has to come off, so uh, take the bolts out, they've either got 13mm heads or 10mm heads. They'll also be held in with thread locks, so be aware of this. Obviously you're not a novice, so you will have the oil drained out of this transfer box before you do any repairs. Now this is the intermediate gear, and at the top here is the input gearing. Alright, so you have the shaft or peg right the way through, which the bearings um, are supported by in the transfer box, okay. And this is the securing nut and the lug which holds the shaft from turning. As I stated earlier, you don't need to remove this, but if you're going to, then this is a 30mm socket, and this one's an M8 threaded bolt. Okay, that comes off. The um, peg then comes through the centre like so. I would recommend using a very soft punch to knock it through, and just be aware that the gear will eventually roll out of the casing, so make sure it doesn't drop and chip any gears. Right, well I had to tip the transfer box just slightly to get this out and it is a very heavy gear so be aware of this 
All right, so I've got it like that, and there are two bearings which have just dropped out. All right, so here's your bearing, your collapsible spacer in the middle, and the other bearing the other side. Now I've decided to actually look at these because these are small bearings and they do actually take a bit of a pounding, so they're worth inspecting. Right, so you have your bearing support plate and you should have two screws. Later ones this has been omitted, but there's one missing on this one. Screws need to be removed first of all, and I'm just being lazy here using a drill with an adapter. And because this is either silicon on or it's got a gasket, then just carefully, don't use a chisel, just be careful to um, pry it apart, break the seal of the gasket of the sealant, and remove this plate. Okay, so this takes actually takes a little bit of effort here. Aluminium is soft, so don't go at it with a hammer and tongue, okay? Right, now that's how you've got the gear out. It's as simple as that. There's no rocket science to this at all. Right, you can see the worn splines on that one. Bearings aren't exactly brilliant, so we'll be changing all that. Now you've got a bearing race here, and inside the casing you also have a bearing race on the other side. Right, we'll just focus up the camera here, and you'll be able to see the bearing race just up here where my screwdriver is. There is also a seal on the other side of this casing which needs to be removed and replaced. Right, so we will be removing this bearing race and well first of all I'll take the seal out and that's with a dodgy old screwdriver and uh, from the other side I can then get the bearing um, race with a punch and tap it out. Try not to damage the casing whatsoever and you will be wanting to look for cracks while you're uh, doing this job as well. If the bearing just drops out without any force then the casing is knackered. Right, so on the bearing support plate, you also have the race with a shim underneath it. Now, this determines the preload of the bearing on the gearing, okay? Knock the race out with the cutouts provided. Right, so the gaskets, if gaskets are fitted, it uh, can be a little bit of a pain in the uh, you-know-where. The best thing I could advise, and if you watch, I'm using a Stanley blade very carefully, um, you could use something with a handle, but what you're achieving to do is just to take the paper gasket off and no metal. Okay, now this probably is the hardest gasket that I've had to remove, and it took about half an hour to clean up this whole casing. While you're removing gaskets, make sure that the whole of the gasket is removed and not the metal. Any chiseling or raised parts of the face can be filed down evenly with a file. All of the holes need to be cleaned out and get the swarf out of it, a gasket swarf or any silicon that happened to be in there, even if you have to run a tap through it. Generally, removing gaskets before you clean it in the wash tank will make sure that all the swarf and debris is gone. Okay, so the parts we actually have here, um, this is our plate and we have our shim here, which we measured. I'll tell you what the size is in a little while. And we have a gasket set which has the seals, o-rings and everything else for it, so that's well good. Bearing set, there's two bearings we have here, and we also have a new gear, which has been cross-drilled. This is a modification. Right, now depending on the ratio of the gearbox will depend on how many teeth this gearing actually has. You'll need to check with the serial number on this one. Right, we also have a nut for the... Um, peg and the collapsible spacer with the two bearings for the intermediate gear. Okay, so the shim which determines the preload, you can measure it with a micrometer. This is the most accurate way of measuring something. And generally, a Land Rover will supply shims that start from 3.15 and go up to 4 millimeters with increments of 0.5 mil. More often than not, you can use the same shim that you have in your transfer box. However, you will need to measure it to make sure, along with checking for the preload, I'll show you how to do this in a little while, if there is any indiscrepancies, you can get the shims from suppliers. For measuring Land Rover, I recommend using the thinnest shim, which is 3.15, fitting it in the housing, then fitting the bearing race back into it, first of all, and driving it home square. What we'll be doing in this tutorial is fitting the bearing race without the shim. This will be a temporary. Then we can measure the amount of movement with a 
DTI. Uh, this will determine what shim we need and we can calculate the preload as well. If we're fitting the original shim and you don't have a DTI, you could use a spring balance and see how much resistance there is on the bearings. But first of all, what we need to do is knock very squarely the other race into the housing. If a bearing race spins in a casing, then the casing is unrepairable. It needs to be replaced. Right, so you can see the bearing race. That's home and square. Being a regular on our channel, you should know how to drift a bearing race in squarely anyway. Right, so I had to cut up a uh, box spanner, which is a wheel bearing box spanner, to get myself a tool so I can push the bearing onto the input gear. This one is absolutely perfect. What you need to do, if you didn't know, is push the inner race in and don't push up against the cage. If the roller cage is damaged, it will cause problems down the line with the bearing. So anyway, basically using a press and pushing the bearings at both ends onto the input gear. Right, so we have the input gear, which is nicely drilled. Okay, this will stop the uh, LT77 output shaft wearing. You can see that, lovely new splines. So we can go ahead and fit this to the transfer box now. Okay, so you should be big enough to know that bearings do need lubrication and only a light lubrication while we're assembling this. Cleanliness is next to godliness and it is also next to um, making sure that no components fail later down the line. So keep things clean. Change your gloves if needs be. Right, so I've sat that in the back bearing race first of all and then I'm going to put on the support housing here. Okay, so sometimes this can be a little bit awkward and if you've got a gasket you need to fit it with a gasket. If it hasn't, then don't worry about it. If it has sealant, then the sealant goes on afterwards once you've made sure that your measurements are right. Okay, I'm using a wire brush here because I actually forgot my soft hammer when I was doing this. But that's the way we go. Don't use hard metal against this aluminium. Right, so you use two bolts. Torque these up to 25 newton meters. All right, these are your slave bolts, which will hold this correct. Okay, you'll notice now that I have actually put the original shim back into the housing and seated the bearing race. So once it's fitted and clamped up, then just a little bit more oil to make the uh, bearing roll smoother. Okay, now what I'm doing here is feeling for resistance. There shouldn't be any end play whatsoever. Shouldn't be any notchiness or tightness as you turn it. Should be fairly smooth. Right, now the spring balance, basically you wrap some cord around it and pull. And what you're doing is measuring the resistance against the spring balance. Now in this tutorial, I'm not going to give you the values. You're going to have to look up in a workshop manual and find them out for yourself. That's your homework. You will see them in the LT230 or LT230R workshop manual. What I'd like you to learn, if you don't know and you haven't got one, is get yourself a DTI and learn how to use it. Because this is really important with setting up certain things in your vehicle, especially transmission units. That's what you've come here for. This is what you're going to learn. Okay, so that's enough of the school teacher um, lecture. Right, so basically Land Rover recommend fitting the thinnest shim in here, which is 3.15 millimeters. We don't have one, so we're going to not put a shim in at all. So what we'll be doing is measuring the full travel of the input shaft and measuring it with the DTI. Okay, so this is zeroed in. I'll pull this right the way back and then push it forwards. So we're measuring the full amount of travel. Basically, because it hasn't got a shim in it, this is actually easier to work out what shim we need, plus adding a preload to it, because this bearing has a 0.05 preload. It'd be worth doing this a couple of times to get the right measurement, but from zero, that's with your DTI zeroed in, we're going to move it all the way, which is 3.35 millimeters. Yes, I know it says a 3.3, almost 3.37, but we're going to discard the 0.02. Right, so to this, we're going to add a 0.05 millimeter, which is required preload. So that will give us 3.40 millimeter shim thickness. We can't go a 3.402 because the 
shims only come in 0.5 millimeter increments so rather go back than forward so we have somewhere very close to the correct preload if for instance you were going to fit a 3.15 millimeter shim in it you would go a which is thickness of installed shim b the recorded end float and then c required preload so this will give you the shim thickness so this is the formula you can use how we've done it has made it a little bit easy because you don't have to do the extra mathematics right so measuring this shim it's actually cock on so we're all right this was 3.40 millimeters so we're all right there we can go ahead and fit this shim and we know that the preload will be correct on the new bearings right so making sure that the bearing race is not going to get dirty make sure you catch it in a very clean rag if there's any damage to this bearing race then you need to replace it you'll have to replace the whole bearing but there you go basically the shims there and we're ready to go it's a gasket on and i'd prefer to use another new gasket which has been greased uh, fit this all into place and tap it down if you need to but remember to use a soft hammer always with aluminium cases all right this is a thor hammer and it has a nylon head on it basically it doesn't cause any damage as long as you don't have any metal contact the aluminium faces you're fine okay so this is possibly where we part ways if you've just removed the gear without the intermediate gear then it's just a matter of putting the covers back on and the sump and getting it back on your vehicle however here we've removed the intermediate gears so what we're going to do is continue on by fitting a slave bolts first of all like here and talking them up to 25 newton meters in the next video we're going to be setting the preload on the intermediate gear bearings here